real success stories told by the people who live them. We're going to have some guests on this show that everybody knows, and we're going to have guests on this show that nobody knows yet. One by one, Nick Heider is adding hits to the hit streak. Blessings, folks. Welcome back to another episode of the hit streak. I'm your man, Nick Heider, and folks, I've got an extra special treat for you in the Hit Lab with me today. Check it out, folks. He is the medical director at Cedar Recovery. He is the co-host of the 70X7 podcast, and uh, there's an amazing eight-part Hulu series called Dope Sick, and uh, this guy is the inspiration behind the series and check it out the actor that portrayed him in this series was none other than michael keatman he was literally played by batman right that is so awesome folks help me welcome dr stephen lloyd dr stephen thank you so much for being here man man nick thanks so much for having me i'm so jacked up about this i've been looking forward to it and you know i tell people about the keaton thing all the time uh, he was a hack before he got my role and uh, i shot him to start him so uh, we can get started like that <laughs> oh man that's that's perfect. That's fantastic. Um, well, man, like it, it really was. It was a it was a great series. Um, it was something that, um, that that we really enjoyed. It's a I mean, it was super uh, like really, really well done, but it really hits close to home for us because we've had family members that have been um, affected by the opioid crisis. And and, um, you know, so like let me ask you this. So like, you know, it's hard. There's so much on this. You hear back and forth from both sides of the media. It's hard to know who to trust anymore. Um, you know, like how serious of a thing is you're dealing with this nationwide, worldwide. How serious of a thing actually is this? It's very serious. If you look at the number of people suffering with it and figure that they touch about seven to eight people in their life, mm. it affects about 75 percent of the population in the United States. If you mm. just do the math. And before I came in here to see you, I got here early and, and I was in the parking lot making some phone calls and, and we had a patient die. Uh, from Saturday morning till this morning. Oh, no. And we found out because his family called to see if he had an outstanding balance of all oh, things. And, and we all know him. And so, yes, it's real. And then when you look at how families are torn apart and ripped apart and then those that are left behind, particularly when it's children and, and, and if there's custody issues or DCS issues, what happens? I mean, this is as real as it gets. And uh, I love working in it because it, it is the most raw place that I can think of in our country right now when you're talking about this. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm really sorry to hear about your patient. You know, those are people they are. And, and you get to know those people. Um so it, so it's real. So, um, well, first of all, like um, I want to tell everybody how how I met you, right? So we were able, fortunate enough to connect. I've talked multiple times about how amazing um, being a guest at the National Prayer Breakfast this year was, and that was where I met you and um, and uh, your son, I believe, was there, and it was a it was a great time. And and um, like first of all, like let's just give the National Prayer Breakfast. We came back so encouraged sure. um, by that experience. It was so neat. Um, how long, like, how many times had you been there? Was that, that your first? That, that's my second time. And I was at a, the, the first time was the one right before the pandemic. And it was an infamous one, uh, because, uh, then President Trump, uh, the night before had given the State of Union address and Nancy Pelosi had famously ripped his speech in half behind him. And, and he had also been acquitted by the Senate in impeachment, uh, the night before. So this was his first public appearance, uh, at the National Prayer Breakfast the, the next day. And so it wound up being a very infamous National Prayer Breakfast, the one that you and I attended. Uh, was the first one after the pandemic mm -hmm. and um, it was a much different feel and just a different feel all the way around for me right. uh, there was so much hope and optimism and and how i got to meet you you know we're, we're baseball guys right and uh, always have been and uh that's I, I, right right if, if you don't like baseball i, I can't help you uh <laughs> but but heath came up to me my son said hey dad he said i met this guy he said you got to come meet him his name's nick so uh, I said, sure, you know, we'll go go meet him. And that's where I met you and you and your wife right after that. Well, it was cool. And like, I just, you know, I just can't believe the the amazing amount of folks that we met. And it's cool because we all had something in common. And that was our faith, which yeah. is really neat. Right. So it's just great to be in a situation where you're surrounded by that many people yeah. that have your, have faith in common with you. It, it is, you know, in, 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 in my, at our table the morning of the prayer breakfast, we sat with a guy named Derek Ramsey. Right. And I did. I knew Derek. I've known Derek since I was a kid. He has no idea who I was. He was a, con a quarterback at the University of Kentucky when my hero, Condridge Holloway, was a quarterback at Tennessee. 
And, I, you know, growing up watching Condridge play, I was an amazed, right? I mean, I was a huge Condridge fan. I had no idea he was the first black quarterback in the SEC. I mean, I'm a kid, right? Mm-hmm. You don't pay attention to that. Just like I didn't pay attention to Henry Aaron. He's getting ready to break Roos' record. That's I right. don't care what color he is. And and to talk to Derek that morning about playing back then in the 70s in the SEC, because Derek was a quarterback at Kentucky, and and he was a tight end. He won a Super Bowl with the Raiders. And he talked about he wished he had went to Canada so he could have been the quarterback. Mm. And I want you – I mean, it hit me square in the chest. I mean, here's a guy that won a Super Bowl ring, and he didn't get the opportunity to play quarterback because at the time there was a bias against black quarterbacks in the right. NFL. And and he wanted to do it so much he would give up a Super Bowl ring in order to do it because he was talking about Condridge because Condridge actually did go to Canada and was in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. So uh, that was a that was a moment for me where you know I get hit with this stuff from time to time that realizes you know there are this, these folks that had been you know just irre, irreparably harmed by things like that in my lifetime. Right. And I love meeting Derek. I can't wait to see him again. And the prayer breakfast does those kind of things. Yeah. Because that's not a moment you see right. And I was trying to explain it to he afterwards because he grew up in a he didn't grow up then right he right. didn't know that and uh so when you know, then getting to meet you and, and i was excited about this when you said man i want to have you on and i and, and i wanted to come earlier right i had had a little health problem pop up but i'm so glad to be here today well brother we got a lot to talk about yeah uh, we got a lot to talk about and um you know so we mentioned kind of where we're at today and obviously talking a lot about the, um, the dope sick stuff but like let's talk a little bit about like how you um how you became the doctor that, that went through all that. And then we'll kind of tell them the story. Maybe we should just tell them the story first. But you didn't want to tell them the story about how you, the, the 30,000 foot view about what happened, what the, basically what the, the show is about. Sure. And then we'll go back and kind of tell them that. How sure. about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, you know, the show was actually, um, you know, meant to portray the mispromotion of the drug Oxycontin by the drug company, Purdue Pharma. And it does a great job with that. And it wants to show their interactions with the sales reps and how they misrepresented the addictive potential of, of this, of this drug. And, and that's what the show's about. Mm. But but the, it's based on a book by Beth Macy. Beth Macy is a writer from from Roanoke, Virginia. He's a friend of mine. Mm. And uh, uh, so Beth's book was a New York Times bestseller. And so uh, I was in Beth's book. When she was researching her book, she ran across me. And I love how she ran across me. It makes me feel a little bit good inside. She had, she had done all this investigating and, and saw, you know, just the hopelessness. And she asked somebody, she goes, is there any hope out there? Oh my I mean, gosh. I want to know something that's hopeful. And the guy says, have you ever met Steve Lloyd? All right. I didn't know her. And she goes, I'm at the deadline of my book. I don't have time to meet another person. He said, you need to call Steve. I was working here in Nashville. I was the I was the medical director for Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services at the time and got a phone call. Mm. And it was Beth Macy. And we started talking and I wound up in her book um, and we became friends. But she called me up one day and she says, Steve, she said, they want to make my book into a Hulu series. And Nick, my first question, of course, is, you know, what is Hulu? I mean, I had any <laughs> idea, right? I mean, I didn't know. I uh, was in the same yeah, thing. Yeah, I was like, what is that? And she goes, well, it's like, you know, Netflix. I, OK, I know what Netflix is. And uh I thought it was great. And she said, well, you know, when we're writing this thing, we want a fictional doctor and we're going to give him his own addiction. And uh, we'd like for you to help us with that. Well, I don't have any experience in writing. I'm not a writer, but I didn't have to be right. I had writers. And right. so I said, you know, sure. Well, this is right in the pandemic and Tennessee's actually shut down, right? March, April. You remember when That's that happened? Right. And so the writers were out in, in Hollywood and uh, Danny Strong was a producer and a writer. And my daughter just loves it that I know Danny Strong, but Danny was into Gilmore Girls and there was another That's big right. thing he was in, right? That's and, right. And uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so my daughter was just in awe of that. But, uh, but you know, Danny's there and the other writers and Bess and Roanoke, and we're all on Zoom, and they're running through these scenarios, right, of, of how we're going to – what what we're going to put this doctor through as he goes through his own addiction. Mm. And none of them were realistic. And Danny finally looked at me and says, Steve, why don't we just use yours? Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and, and as I told you, you know, I thought, well, the main reason we're not going to use mine is because I'm going to take that to my grave. <laughs> and and I, I thought about it literally, Nick, in 15 seconds. Yeah. And I said, yes. Wow. Absolutely. And and that's where it went. And, and you know, we proceeded. And, and really, you know, it wasn't anything fancy. I just told them stories. You know, we're, we're connected by stories. You and I are connected by stories, right? We yes. just spend time in your office, right? We're what, looking at baseballs, and there's stories behind those. You know, Brooks Robinson, Mickey Mantle, there's stories there. And and so so I said, yeah, you know, let's do this. And uh, I simply told them stories. And it was emotional. Um Still emotional. Yeah. But I figured that there were people out there like this, like our show here. There are people out there to listen to this that are that are struggling with this. 
and I want them to have some hope. You know, oh. you don't have to keep living like that. And, and you know, here's what happened to me. This happened to me, my path. Yeah. And and this is how I came out on the other side of it. And then, you know, then when I saw the series, because I didn't, you know, I'm watching it just like everybody else. As a matter of fact, it was a couple of years later. And Beth called me up and she said, Steve, we're having the premiere in Roanoke tonight. It's like in October, I think. And I was having oral surgery um, and I couldn't go. And, you know, how many times you get to go to a premiere, right? And, yeah. And Steve's having oral Especially surgery. Especially when you're played by right, Batman. Right. And so I knew Keaton was was cast in, in you know, my character. And, and so, which was really cool for me, but I'm more Beetlejuice than Batman, but that's okay. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so you know, I didn't didn't think that much about it. The next day I came into work and Sterling, uh, who, who runs our social media at work, said, hey, Steve, are you in trouble? Now, Nick, you know my past. So, hey, it's possible, right? That's right. And I said, I don't think so. And he said, well, you had, you know, I can't remember, like 1,500 hits on your LinkedIn page last night, which is unusual. Wow. And come to find out that, it, you know, after the premiere, they'd ask Beth, was was Keaton's character based on a real person? And she said, yes. And she gave him me. And so people had, you know, searched me on LinkedIn and social media. So that's really how it came out. And, um, you know, Nick, I watched it like everybody else. I'm watching it unfold. And to see those events in my life was it was moving. I can't, I can't imagine actually um, yeah it was it was it was it was strange right yeah. because there was a time in my life where i would said nobody's ever going to know this sure nobody's ever going to know that i went into the to the neighborhood and you know and, and bought drugs from a you know from somebody that i knew and uh you know or opened up a, a desk drawer and there's a bunch of pill bottles in there and i realized suddenly that all those are mine and there's literally hundreds of them. I mean, nobody's ever going to know that. And then all of a sudden it's portrayed in this series. And those are emotional moments in the series. And, uh, you know, I connected with them. I relived them. Um, and and I struggled with them a little bit as I watched them because I'm watching be, it from the outside. You got to be pretty secure to do that. Folks, yeah. t- listen at this. I want you guys to understand this. So um, when you watch it, you'll see, um, Dr. Stephen, you were it, it was it was progressive over time, but you got up to. Uh, a 100 pill a day addiction right to oxycontin that's right it's unbelievable i bought a i bought a bar from a guy that had an issue with that i'm pretty sure he still struggles with it today and when we cleaned out his office later it was everywhere in the office yeah. within those desk drawers and all that stuff yeah it's one of those things that you know you don't see coming i tell people i didn't wake up one day and say hey i think i'll take 20 years of education and chuck it out the window mm-hmm. right i was a doctor I'd worked my entire life through medical school and residency to get to that point. And so started off taking a half of a five milligram hydrocodone, two and a half milligrams of hydrocodone. And within four years, I'm using 100 pills a day, you know, 500 milligrams That's every day. Un- unbelievable. Nick, I couldn't do anything without it. You know, I had kids. You know, mm. I was just in your office. I saw you and your kid, That's right? right? You know what that is. You take a bullet for them. Absolutely. Right? All the bullets. No doubt. And, and with a smile on your face, mm-hmm. right? And imagine what it would be like if in order to get to that point you had to have something else out here right and so my kids and my wife and my family weren't the most important thing my most important thing was this because without this i wasn't okay wow and uh it's a sobering moment and it's a really sobering moment when you realize you can't control it wow and i hear people talk about all the time so oh you don't want it bad enough you got to find your bottom and it drives me nuts okay because i don't know how much of a bottom you have to find and I wanted it more than anything in the world. I couldn't quit. Right. And, uh, you know, and then to see that portrayed on the on the screen and, and you know, watching Michael Keaton do it because he did such a great job with it. I mean, I lived that and, uh, you know, stuck his hand through a plate glass window, you know, to get his pills. Well, you know what he tried to do is lock them up for himself. Well, that's a real story. I did that. But you and I are baseball guys. Right. And and uh, so I coached these teams growing up and I had some really good players. Uh, mm-hmm. Several of them made the big leagues. That's awesome. And we're playing in the state little league finals, final game in the state of Tennessee. Big right. deal right little league yeah absolutely so i get in the dugout i've got these little boys in front of me i'm getting ready to give them a pep talk and i realize uh, that i dropped my pills somewhere oh my yep and the only place i could have dropped them was in the outfield hitting fly balls so i got one of my assistant coaches to come in and give the kids a pep talk while i went around the dugout or dug around in the grass for those pills and i think about that all the time I, there are things that are triggering for me, like if I'm the Little League World Series comes on in, you know, in August and yep. or, you know, I'll be watching a kid's game, a youth league game. And I'll think about that as much as I love those little boys. And I do. I love every one of them. I follow them all today. They all know it. I was out there in, in the grass digging around in my hands trying to find my pills. Mm. And uh, this is not play, a, a place that that I could see myself getting to. But I was for sure there. Wow. 
Wow. It's, you know, unless you've gone through something like that, who know, you know, and we, I'm so glad that you didn't, it, it like, again, it takes a certain security level to be okay and comfortable with your skeletons being aired out. And honestly, that's the, it's the greatest feeling ever when it's done, isn't it? Oh, it's amazing, you know, to, to live without those secrets inside. And when I got to, when I got to treatment and the people who helped me, really a guy named Chip Dodd and, and Chip told me, he said, Steve, you're sick, you're sick as the secret you keep. Mm. and oh wow you know, how good is that <laughs> and i think about that and, and nick I, I don't do this perfectly right I, it, I still struggle and when i get something inside of me that needs to come out it's just a matter of how long i want to be sick I and mean, this is all biblical right i mean yes. all of it absolutely and and, and uh it's just a matter of how long i, I want to live like that and, and most of the time most days this is me this is this is my stuff and this is what i'm bringing but here's the other side of it right here's what i'm bringing to you today because i can connect with you today based on that stuff i wouldn't trade it you know if i could go back and do that over would i change it no i wouldn't because i wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today right i wouldn't be involved with the people i'm involved with on a daily basis i get to watch people's lives change it's a miracle and i wouldn't trade that now am i telling you i want to go back and do it again no Absolutely not. But I'm telling you, I wouldn't change it. So, you know, for for me, looking at the at those scenes on TV and, and when they happened, it was a feeling of sadness. Like I got to that point. Yeah. But also a feeling of hope. Man, mm. I walked through that and this is where I am now. And that's the thing I want people to see. You don't have to keep living like that. Amen. Amen. Um, so and we say it around here a lot. Again, how important it is to, to tell your story. Because, um, you know, in, in your living proof of it, like the purpose, we say it here a lot, the purpose or the person that you're most uniquely qualified uh, or most uniquely positioned to help is the person that you used to be. Yeah. It, it, you know, there's so many there's so many things about that. that, that you told me that when we before you came in and it's great. And I'm going to use it in, in recovery terms. We, we call it the old you spot it, you got it thing. Right. Mm. And and so it, it is that, you know, when I sit down with a patient and I see him in front of me and I see him struggling, I'm see them holding this stuff in i start telling them stories mm. and it's about me right i'm talking about me yeah and i'll watch them draw those lines and i'll watch them draw those connections and i talk about you know stealing drugs or taking drugs from people's medicine cabinets those type of things stealing from my parents and you can almost watch that stuff melt away they realize they're not the only one that's right and you know all the medicine i learned in medical school pales in comparison to the medicine that i've learned in recovery and connection mm. and i tell people all the time the opposite of addiction is not recovery right the opposite of addiction is community and relationship it's it's one of the things i like about sitting here talking to you right now this is all right it's not like all this stuff is around us if i couldn't see the headphones on yours just me and you sitting here talking real stuff that's right there's a connection to that our brain actually releases a chemical in our, you know called oxytocin mm -hmm. and it draws us to each other it makes us feel good mm. so even though we're talking about tough stuff right now there's a connection to what's going on right now Absolutely. and it feels good right and i love that so when I do talks, I'm not a charts and graphs guy. I got like seven slides, right? And sure. I can I can make it last 15 minutes or three hours, however long you want to. And and people always walk away with it. And they're like, man, that, and I just feel, you know, I feel connected. And I said, yes, that's right. People don't get connected to charts and graphs. They get connected to stories. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, it was um like – so were you, tell me about your medical career when, when all this happened, because you're doing something totally different now than you did when you went through this, right? Right. If you told me when I was in medical school and residency that I was going to be an addiction medicine doctor, my first question, of course, would have been, what is that? <laughs> all right. Because that's not one of the specialties that you think about, but never dream this. All right. I mean, it wasn't anywhere on my radar. And it's kind of weird. The two things that I didn't want to be in medical school, because you go through three years of medical school, your fourth year, you know, you, you kind of pick what you want to do. The two things I didn't want to be, I did not want to be an OBGYN physician, okay? Because I couldn't stand the birthing process. I used to tell people, you know, the placenta used to hit me in the back of the head. I couldn't wait to get out of the room, <laughs> right? And and then I didn't want to be a psychiatrist because I'd never saw anybody get better. Okay. And so I wound up in addiction medicine. And the thing that I love more than anything is taking care of, of of women who are pregnant and using drugs and uh if if i got to pick the patients that i'm going to see for the rest of my life that's the group i want to see mm. and it was the two things 
that I didn't want to be in med school, right? The two, bottom of my list. So I'm a trained internal medicine physician. So I worked in the hospital residency training programs uh, back in my hometown. I'm a Northeast Tennessee boy. I'm from Jonesboro. Mm -hmm. Uh, Went to medical school at East Tennessee State and and did residency and then was on faculty there uh, during the first part of my addiction. The um so when you when you got started with all that stuff mm-hmm. like like what was the how did you like how did your addiction story begin actually like what was the actual well you know I was in, in my last year of residency training and you know I'm getting ready to step out on my own and and you know we didn't have work hour restrictions back then and so I'm working a lot I'm chief resident in the hospital I uh, don't like my wife very much I uh, don't like my kids very much right this that story anxiety depression these things I thought I had and I was driving home from work one day after a long day popped a glove compartment in my truck open and they laid some old Norcos in there hydrocodone acetaminophen we know them as Vicodin Mm -hmm. and I looked down at those things Nick and I had a conscious thought you know my patients take these things all the time I broke one in half threw it in my mouth and drove about 10 minutes to where I was living and suddenly my wife's better my job's not as hard my kids are better behaved okay well that's not true nothing changed on that 10 minute drive what I didn't realize in the area of our brain that that interprets pain doesn't separate physical from emotional pain. So this emotional baggage that I had been dragging around my whole life from childhood abuse, physical and sexual abuse, everything. It's not an excuse, just how I got where I am. Yeah. Suddenly it was relieved. And suddenly yeah, I sure. felt I felt like I'd found the answer. And within, you know, three years, I'm using 500 milligrams of Oxycontin a day. And I found Oxycontin because it didn't have acetaminophen in it. And this is going to sound ridiculous from a doctor. But but the thing I was really worried about with that many pills was actually was actually not the dope. It wasn't the oxycodone or hydrocodone or whatever happened to be taken. It was all the acetaminophen in it. Tylenol. Mm. Tylenol is un- unbelievably toxic to your liver. Right. And then each one of those pills a lot of times had, you know, 350, 500 milligrams of Tylenol in them. And so when I found Oxycontin, that was a drug that was just pure drug. Right. No ox, no hydrocodone. I'm sorry, not no hydrocodone, no acetaminophen, no ibuprofen, just pure unadulterated opioid. Yeah. And and that was really when it really took off. Mm. So in the in the where in the how so connect me in the movie or the in the show when um, where the story became yours and it was basically you from then on out. Uh, so so Keaton got there a little bit differently than I did. There was a few things in there that were, were that were not exactly as they happened, but we we wanted to give him a common pathway. Mm-hmm. Mine was not a common pathway. The common pathway is you get hurt, right? You hurt your knee, you yeah. have your shoulder. His was a car wreck. Okay. So at the end of episode three, uh, spoiler alert. Uh, He's involved in a car wreck and then he winds up on the drug that he's actually prescribing for his patients, which is the same thing I did. And then he realizes, hey, you know, this feels pretty good. Suddenly, you know, he he'd lost his wife. So he was, a, you know, he was a widower and he had some emotional baggage he's carrying around. And, and you know, his addiction took off from there, Nick. And so he got there by a little bit different path. But the reason we did that, because that's such a common pathway. You know, there's so many people out there that are suffering from opioid addiction that didn't wake up one morning and think, hey, I think I'll throw everything away. They were in high school and they, you know, tore their ACL or a common one, a really common one, wisdom tooth extraction. Right. Oh, wow. And that's a really common one. And so I see these people, you know, these young people in, in Middle Tennessee where I live and love now that, you know, just a few years ago were Friday night football stars or they were cheerleaders or they're in the band or they're in the drama program at their school. And now, you know, they're sticking a needle in their arm. Mm-hmm. How in the world does that happen in five or six years? And that is a common pathway. And so that was a reason that, you know, we did that with the Keaton character is that, you know, he has a car wreck. And so he winds up needing pain medication. He got hurt in the car wreck. And then now sudden the pain goes away, but the medication does. Mm. And so he got into his a little bit different than mine, but that's the start of his. What are what's being done um, to help knowing that this is a thing? I mean, it's it's nobody's hiding it anymore, you know, right. um, and it's it's craziest part is like it's it's a legal version of a, an illegal drug. Right. And um, and every nothing's horrible for you in, do- in the right doses you know what i mean like alcohol and all those things it's not gonna kill you it's not gonna hurt you too bad not gonna kill you whatever but like what are what, what like what's being done about it what can we do like we're, we're making progress but it's not quick enough right we there's so many people dying like we lost 3032 tennesseans last year to drug overdoses and 75 percent of those were were opioids good grief 70 to 80 percent of heroin users started with prescription pain medication Right. And so the the thing that we have to Say do Say that again, 70? 70, 70 to 80% oh my gosh. of heroin users 
started with prescription pain medication. So that this is the thing that people don't realize. It's the gateway. It, it is. It, yeah, that is the classic gateway. And oxycodone, hydrocodone, that's just pharmaceutical heroin. Right. It's because because the, the pure opioid that comes out of the poppy plant is morphine. Why don't they just call it heroin? Well, yeah, I did. I actually have a actually have a talk that says prescribing heroin. So yes, I did because I wanted to get people's attention. I, it would like as a parent, you're like, here, take this oxycodone versus take this heroin, dude. And when you hear that word come out of your mouth, it's like. Are we giving them? Are we giving them heroin? Exactly. Like, I know that's the reason for my talk, right? And prescribing heroin. I do that. Your both your eyebrows go. What are you talking about, Doc? Yeah. Oxycodone. Well, that's different. So if you watch Dope Sick, you'll see how the Sackler family of Purdue Pharma came up with oxycodone as the extended release. Oxycodone doesn't sound as bad as morphine, and you have to admit it doesn't. No. It, I told you right now, Nick. I'm going to you know shoot you with 10 milligrams of morphine. You're like, oh goodness. Yeah. Or Nick, hey, I'm going to give you this 15 milligrams of oxycodone. Okay. Well, turns out the oxycodone is actually stronger than the morphine. It's 1.5 morphine equivalent. So that means that one milligram of oxycodone is actually 1.5 milligrams of morphine. So it's actually stronger. Yeah. It just doesn't sound as bad. No. Right? It's the optics. And so so that's the deal. So all heroin is, is the is the morphine that comes out of a poppy plant with a couple of methyl groups stuck on it. And actually, the bear company used to make it, market it, sold it in pharmacies as kind of a cure for opioid addiction, if you can believe that. Heroin, diacetylmorphine. Good so, you know, you, it is heroin it is opioids but i'm not one of these people says oh we've got to get rid of it we absolutely don't sure there are chronic pain patients out there the medication has changed their life absolutely there are end of life care that is absolutely needed chronic cancer pain that there is no other way to give people relief we absolutely do not need to get rid of the medication right but we have to have prescribers and medical professionals that understand the medication they're prescribing and understand the risk of addiction mm. and there is where the rubber meets the road because we're not meeting that standard in the united states today in medical education who where does the responsibility truly lie from because like in in the in the movie did they portray the sales process to the doctors and and all the incentivizations and all that how 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 accurate was that they did a good job with that now that part didn't come from me uh, it was actually a friend of mine in, in southwest virginia but it was accurate you know maybe they go a little overboard with a couple of things but it's pretty accurate right the free lunches the speaker bureaus the the vacations for two days to learn about the medication that's all pretty accurate and i didn't do a lot of that um, but I have been to them, you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a young doc, I definitely been to them. And, you know, when you come out of medical school with $150,000 worth of debt and somebody's going to take you to the nicest restaurant in town, you know, most of the time you'll go. And, <laughs> yeah. it, and, and this is where doctors come into play. You know, doctors say that that, uh, you know, I can't be bought for as little as a, as a meal. And I always laugh. Doctors can be bought for as little as some pens and paper in their office. They just don't realize it. Right. It's called, you know, uh, subconscious implicit bias. I had a doctor not long ago told me he didn't have any unconscious bias. I said, you don't understand the word unconscious. <laughs> You're not aware right? of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. So, yes, behavior can be changed by that. And, and so it's attractive. It's very easy to slip into. And they did a great job with it, particularly with the relationship he had with the main the main pharmaceutical rep. And I forget. I always think of him. This is going to be terrible. I always think of him as, as Kenny from We're the Millers. Yeah. Right. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, Will Poulter. And and so that relationship. And then, you know, as Will Poulter goes through the process and starts to see his drug, I don't know how much of that happened. OK. Right. I don't know how many Purdue Pharma reps out there actually came around to that because they were being paid a boatload of money. Now, some of them may hear this and say otherwise. I just didn't see that there. You don't know what, how they were trained and, mm -hmm. and what happened. That was all. Uh, uh, proprietary information mm -hmm. that was done behind closed doors and right. secure and everything right. else. And they um, like, as far as the responsibility, like, so, you know, I, one would hope that the most doctors, if they knew the true dangers behind it, they wouldn't be, because in the movie, Keaton didn't understand what he was doing. He didn't understand that the, the, um, like the the bad things that were going that could happen to these people, the addictions and everything else, right. um, and literally until he went through it himself, you know, and it's almost like you wouldn't believe somebody if they told you if you didn't go through it yourself in something like that. And I remember he kept questioning the reps, you know, is this real and all that stuff. How, so, you know, like if it's you need it, but we don't need near as much of it, 
because it's getting into the wrong hands and it's abused. How do you stop them from making so much? Well, that, that's a good point. So people ask about blame all the time. There's plenty of blame to go around. And, and we do need to have accountability and we need to make reparations for the people who've been damaged. And that's what came from the opiate lawsuits that we, you know, we see money coming from right now. But there's plenty of blame to go around, Nick. You know, and, and when you look at you look at the Keaton character, he's exactly right. He's practicing rural medicine in West Virginia. Yeah. Right. And he's working how many hours per week? He was he's, like the doctor of the town. There wasn't, there wasn't another one. That's right. It's him. And so he's getting called all hours of the night. He's working in the day. He's got hospital patients. And then, you know, a lot of people complaining of pain. And now you come along. So if you're going to if you're going to have a pain medication or any medication, you've got to know how doctors are trained. And when we look at medication, the first thing we look for, is it safe? Not does it work? Is it safe? We're taught this in med school. Mm. Next is does it work? Right. Mm. Next is can you be compliant with it? you got to take it five times a day versus one time a day? And then last is actually cost. So so if you're going to market the drug, you got to overcome the number one obstacle which is what safety right and if you watch the series that's exactly what they did they knew that that was the number one thing they had to overcome we got to show this drug is safe opioids have a long history we've known they've been addictive since the time of hippocrates for gosh sakes yeah so so we've got to overcome that so here's studies in the new england journal of medicine to show it to be less than one percent addictive and the keaton character says that's not possible he was right how like so and when 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 companies like they release something, some press like that that says that, like you know. So how do, how does somebody back then? Um, I can remember, like my parents, even me growing up, it was like if your if your doctor said it, it was law, right? It just was what it was. There was a trust mm-hmm. that, um, and and trust is always earned. And I had great ones. I've never had a bad experience, right? right? So all my all my all the people that have worked on me and helped me and my family have been absolutely amazing, and they earn that trust. But, you know, how many people go to a doctor for the first time or even an ER thing or whatever? That person don't know you. They don't know your background. They don't know your history and a lot of things unless it's on a documented on a chart somewhere. How did that? How did, but that person trusts them as if they've been working on their whole entire life. How would a patient um, uh, how should a patient handle that situation if they don't know the person or like how many questions should they ask? I don't know. I don't think there is a way. Right. Because our, our medical professionals out there, doctors, nurse practitioners and physicians, the census, the one that has prescribing power, you aren't trained appropriately on this. Mm. You know, addiction is genetics, trauma and opportunity. Right. The most widely available, socially acceptable thing people have trouble with is what? Alcohol. Right. Anybody can share. What would be more widely available and socially acceptable that came off of the doctor's prescription pad? Mm. Right. Mm. And so that was that was really that was really where, you know, things fell apart because I need this medication. If I didn't need it, my doctor wouldn't write it. Well, the doctor was acting under pretenses that the medication was safer than we've always thought. Yeah. You had these pain societies that had popped up everywhere that were funded by industry that really nobody paid attention to. And so there's plenty of things to go on. The FDA, right? The FDA, you know, gave uh, Purdue Pharma the, you know, the the wording in their, their package insert that this drug was possibly less addictive than the shorter acting agents. There was no medical evidence. Evidence for that, they guess they they ended up getting sued big time over that, they, right? They did. So one of the things that one of my current roles, I'm the chair of the Opie Debatement Council here in Tennessee, and over the next 18 years, we've got about 672 million dollars coming into our state to help abate the damage done from that, and that came from the lawsuits that you're talking about right mm. now. So yeah, they have been sued, but but you know, but there's plenty of blame, right? The DEA, the DEA is is actually who says how many how much opioid can actually be made and produced and destroy and and you know, sent out. Right. So there's plenty of blame to go around. And, and we do need to we need to look at that and see what happened. Right. How did the holes of the Swiss cheese line up? Mm. Right. And we absolutely need to do that. But we can't get so focused on that that we don't look at what the solutions are going forward, mm. because then we're tossing hand grenades at each other. And and I want to make you know, then people need to be accountable. I need to be accountable. Sure. As a physician, I wrote it. I am accountable. Sure. And, and my job going forward is to educate, you know, young doctors, young physicians on this. And we have a, we have, you know, our local university here, Vanderbilt Medical School, does a great job with this. And they actually have it in their curriculum. I'm, I'm one of, I'm just a very small part of that training program, but I'm a, I'm a part of it in that role. And I love to see those changes because I promise you, Nick, when I was coming through school, that was not the case. Yeah. So there are changes coming, but we need them. We need them universally. And it has to, has to be, you know, the DEA, the F, uh, the, um, uh, um, um, I was just trying to think the DEA, I said already, um, <laughs> just totally lost the word. Uh, pharmacists, doctors, right? Everybody who touches this process has to look at their role, own their role, and then work to fix it going forward. 
Mm. And they have to work. They have to work together. Yeah. And then, um, and there's always um, there's always a public publicly traded company with the board and whatever that's just not that's looking at just yeah. bottom line numbers and black and white pages, right? I get that one all the time, and I'm in those rooms, and and every time it's my turn to speak, I kind of just put all that stuff to the side, and I bring the patient right back in the room because that's what we're doing, right? Mm. And and. And I've been in a lot of rooms, you know, I've been afforded opportunities that, that just make me, you know, I'm in awe. I, I tell people I'm Forrest Gump. I have no idea how I got here. It, it just happened. Yeah. What's it? Hey, Forrest Gump was a great story. Hey, too. Absolutely. And and I, I use that because every time I'm in those rooms and I have those people's attention, I bring the focus back to the families that have been ripped apart. Our families here in Middle Tennessee, our families all across the state. I want to make sure we don't forget those faces. There's a terrible quote out there by a mass murderer, and I won't I won't honor him by by saying his name, but he said, "A one death is a tragedy. A million deaths are, is a, a statistic." Oh wow! And I never want to forget that because we can't forget these individual stories, and we can't lose focus so much that we forget what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to heal families. Sure. And uh, so anytime I'm in those rooms, that's my message. Um, and and you know the blame thing is the blame thing. The lawsuits will, will straighten that out as best as possible. But we've got this money in Tennessee for the next 18 years. And I tell our group every time we meet, it's our job to honor those that we've lost by how we spend this money. Mm. And I believe it. Mm. Let me ask you this: the the lawsuits, and and, and that's a big amount of money. You just said, mm-hmm. um, in the big scheme of things, how big of a dent can it put into into the problem? You think small, small, yeah. But there's a but there's a lot of work that could still be done behind, of, that, behind that money. There is. I, I tell people, you know, if you wanted to truly abate this, first of all, you can't bring people back from the dead. Okay, so right. that's tough. How do you value those lives and in years of lives lost? There's Ooh. a way to do that economically, but how do you do it emotionally, right? And so it's it's impossible. The money is not near enough, but it's enough for a good start. Our, our attorney general here in Tennessee, you know, when he gave us our, our, our counsel, it's charge. He said, you're setting up a, a treatment system for Tennesseans for the next two to three decades. And so we can make some headway with this. Wow. But, but Nick, we can't do it in isolation. It has to be a community effort. You know, one of the things that, you know, I wrote on your wall, 70 times seven. I love that. Right. Um, you know, how do we look at people with addiction? And there's plenty of, of stories in the Bible about it. It's, it just doesn't say addiction. Right. Right. You know, you want to the beggar on the street. You want to avoid eye contact and move the other side of the road. And, and I tell I tell folks, you know, every major religious text in the world has one theme in common and it's love your neighbor. Everyone. I I haven't found a text that hasn't had that. And that's what this is. That's what we're talking about right here today. And no matter where they are, we, we talk about it on a daily basis. We want to meet people where they are, no matter what. We want to love them unconditionally. We want to forgive habitually. And we want to demonstrate mercy. And and I see people looking at addiction as moral failure and say, we've got to show these people some tough love. I remember no stories in the Bible where Christ stepped back and said, you know what? What I've got to do here to the woman at the well, I've got to show her some tough love. Mm. Didn't see that. Mm. I saw him love her, mm. right? And and really, that's what this is about. And it's why I love it so much. That's why I love it so much. It's why I love the concept of seventy times seven. You know, yes, Jesus. You know, how many chances? You know, how, how many times do you forgive somebody? Seven, seventy. And Jesus says seventy times seven. Why not that? And his point wasn't four ninety. His point was how many they need. Yeah, right. And I'm also not saying there aren't consequences. There are consequences. But my job is to help my patient find the path to recovery that's right for them, not the one that I happen to find. Right. They may have a different path. There you go. And so I think a lot of times we get hung up in that. And so I know that was a long winded uh, answer to your uh, to your question, but those are the principles that that, that I try to operate by daily. It, it's it, it's such a like you know you hear golly I, I, the the world's full of problems. That's that's what the world. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> is to is to um, that's part of our mission um, as human beings. And the world's full of problems, but this one is is a big one, and I don't feel like it's getting enough attention and like in the so like if you were to if there was a pie graph of all the the top leading ways of of deaths in tennessee the united states or whatever you know there's guns that they're they're, they're really focused on that right now then there's there's car accidents and all that stuff where does this fall like how big a piece of, how big a piece of pizza would this be in the pie it's bigger than the two you just mentioned combined but so that's yeah. that's unbelievable so folks say that so say that again so the opioid crisis is causing more deaths than 
What were the two I gave? Then then guns? Guns and car wrecks. We gun. passed car wrecks a long time ago. And you throw, you know, gun deaths in there, uh, you know, deaths from from drug overdoses are still still dwarfs it. I, I think what the like what is sounding to me, correct me if I'm wrong, is like, you know, um not everybody um or, or a lot, a lot of people own a lot of people own guns. So there's more people that have guns that aren't doing damage than than are, mm-hmm. and and um, everybody drives a car. Yeah, everybody drives a car, but not everybody takes um, uh, opioids. Not everybody takes those painkillers, right? So it's almost like it's almost like the if you know you, if you just grouped them in, it, you know, ten people have a gun, ten people have a car, ten people have opioids. 10 people have opioids is it's going to be almost 10 out of 10 and it might might not even be one out of 10 on the other two sure. it'll, it'll dwarf them and, and fentanyl's changed the ball game so I try what to, exactly is fentanyl well fentanyl is actually a useful opioid that we use in the hospital a lot and for chronic pain particularly cancer pain and it's usually in a patch or or there's some sublingual uh, fentanyl pr- preparations that we use and it's very useful when we talk about fentanyl now we're not talking about that we're talking about illicit fentanyl made in labs mostly in china and brought into the United States from from you know Canada and Mexico, and I'm not a border guy. I can't get into that. It's just how it gets. Sure. You. So if you think about it, if you're going to have a if you're going to have a you know you're going to be a heroin guy, right? And you're going to you're going to sell heroin. You got to have a room. You got to have a field full of poppy plants. Hmm. Well, if you're going to be a fentanyl person, you got to have a chemist in a lab. This is Breaking Bad. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Right. So that's how I try to explain it to people because you don't need a field full of poppy plants. Now you need a chemist, right? Hmm. You need some precursor, and it's dirt cheap, and it's it's numerical powers of 10 greater than heroin. And so if you get a hold of car fentanyl, say, uh, and you think you're taking an oxycodone that looks like, you know, something that you would get from the pharmacy, I can't tell the difference in looking at them. And, and that's supposed to be 1.5 morphine equivalent. So really 15 milligrams of morphine and you get a hold of car fentanyl. Well, that's a thousand morphine equivalent and you die. Wow. And you don't even know that you take it. So that is the issue. And and I told you I'm not a graphs guy and I'm not a numbers guy, but here's one that, that gets my attention. We lost 107,622 Americans to overdose. So last year we have numbers for that is a 747 fully loaded, crashing and burning and killing everybody on board every 36 hours around the clock for a year. Good grief. And if that was happening, me or you wouldn't get on an airplane. Correct. The problem is, is that they happen in isolation. They happen in Clark Range, Tennessee, in a in a bedroom from a kid that people forgotten about. Oh my gosh! They happen here in Brentwood, Tennessee. Yeah, with a family that doesn't want anybody to know that their daughter's struggling with addiction, mm. and there's no voice. There's no marches on Washington. Uh, this is the opioid crisis. Is this generation's HIV and AIDS? Gotcha. The parallels are unbelievable. The biggest hindrance to treatment is stigma, just like it was in the 80s and 90s. And uh, it, I, I talk about it all the time. This is this generation's HIV and AIDS crisis. The, the problem is, is that we don't have a movement like they, they actually wound up having. Groups like ACT UP, who marched on Washington, fast track their drugs to, you know, to save people's lives. And stigma slowly melt away. I'm not telling you it's 100% gone, but when's the last time you opened a newspaper and saw an article on HIV disease or AIDS? We talked about, I saw an ad for an HIV medication the other night, and I looked at my wife and I was like, I thought that we were past that. I know. Like, I hadn't seen i hadn't even heard of that or thought of it in so long yeah we were we were in washington dc recently and we were with a lady named sandy thurman who i love and she was president clinton's aide czar sandy's an awesome person my son heath was with us heath is 28 and and heath can't remember when aids was a public health crisis and i remember sitting there looking at sandy's face and she was smiling and i looked at her and i said that has to feel good doesn't it she said yeah she said, I didn't know if I'd see that in my lifetime. Wow. We are capable of that. Mm. Right. We are. And and so I'm not telling you that HIV disease and AIDS is not a problem today. It is. But it's not what it was in the 1980s. 19- remember when magic came out? Right. Yeah. And magic says, I've got HIV. I remember watching that because it was before I met the med school. And he the said, world I'm, stopped. It stopped. Everything's stopped. here's the head of Showtime. Right. Yeah. And and he says, I've got HIV disease. And then he said something after that. that I think people overlook. He said, I'm going to live. He said that. I mean, it's in the press conference. And I remember sitting there thinking, you'll be dead in five years. Yeah. Well, I saw him, you know, when the Dodgers and the Braves were playing. If I saw him in the stands and, you know, he ain't missed many meals, right? I mean, he he's alive. He looks great. He looks 
he looks really good. You know, he lose a few pounds, he could probably get back out there. But, that's right. But but my point is, is that the stigma is the biggest thing that prevents people from getting help, and that's why I draw the parallels. And and these families out here are are suffering in silence. And we've got a great movement here in Middle Tennessee, mainly by some ladies out in Williamson County who lost their kids to to drug overdoses, heroin overdoses. I, I'm a parent. I'm, I'm. It's something that I think about. Sure. You. Why wouldn't you? I tell parents if you want a reason to stay up at night, this is it. Yeah. Because you don't even have to be addicted to drugs. You can go to a party and somebody give you a pill and it'd be fentanyl and you die. Yeah. Use one time. Yeah. But but these women have just they've energized me because they talk about their kids and how much they love them and the fact oh. that they lost their battle with addiction. When we start having things like that happen, now we're starting to move forward. You know, what's the why do you think it is that I hear an HIV ad on TV, but I don't hear anything about this yeah. on you know like like what like what are we doing you know like how did how does this how does this happen how do we get here how do we stay here how does this how does this keep happening and again you know i've had um two family members that have been affected by this and 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 um thank the lord they're they're both doing really well and they're on the other side of it but you know one of them it's been it's been a my son's 13, probably close to 15 year battle. Mm-hmm. Okay. And just in the last like six to nine months, as that person became clean and, and on their own. And, and now they're still dealing with the last 15 years of, of issues that it's caused mm-hmm. financially, health, like health wise, everything else. I mean, people's teeth are having to get redone and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it messed them up. They don't even look like the same people. And, and now they, they will if they stay on the path and everything else. But it's just, it's, it's hard. It breaks your heart. It, it does. And, and this is one of the reasons that I talk about it so much, because there are a lot of doctors out there that have the issue that I have the gotten better and are doing great. And they don't tell anybody because they don't want the stigma associated with it. And I had this thought when I was still in treatment and Chip helped me with this. How would you feel if you had a disease that you never saw anybody get better from? Mm. Right. I mean, what if you never saw anybody come out on the other side? Yeah. And I remember having that thought and I said, you know, if I, if, if, if this works out, if, if, and, and, and it worked out because of my support system, right? It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with my support system. Sure. But, but if this works out, I'm not going to live in the shadows. And, you know, we live in Music City, right? Nashville, Tennessee. That's right. We, the music industry has been riddled with this, right? And we know that. And we've had some of our country music stars come out and talk about this openly. I wish that they, I wish that they knew how much that mattered. Mm. I wish that, they knew how much it matters to people when they openly talk about it because they have these huge platforms. And I've seen a few of them do it. I'm not going to name them a name. We know who they are. But the people that they reach, it's just amazing. It's, why, right. I, it's why I love this today, right? Absolutely. We're going to reach people today. And I am grateful for you to doing that, for doing this. Well, we're, I'm grateful for you for all the work you're doing. This is just, I'm you know, blessed to have a platform. And, and, and again, when you have a platform, it's kind of like when you have access to those drugs, you have a great responsibility sure. that comes with that, those gifts. And, um, and that's not something that we, we take very lightly, you know, and, and, and these things are on online and, and there's, um, we're approaching our hundredth episode and it's, and it's big. And, and there's, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of hours of me on film that are going to live forever. And, uh, my kids, my grandkids and everybody else are going to have access to those. That's why I don't, you know, use a lot of profanity, um, on the microphone and stuff because I don't want my kids to, one, I don't want my kids to be affected by something I did, right? My behavior, right? And if it's bad, I'm not perfect anyways, but at least I'm not, I'm, I'm most of my imperfections aren't on camera when we're doing stuff like this, you know, and, and they have to live that down. But, um, it's, Man, it's just it's as as a as a parent and knowing that the kids are going to hang out and party and do stuff and and I I would I, I may be wrong but I would think that a lot of the times the people that that take the pill and die the person that gave them to and didn't know it was going to kill them mm-hmm. you know they were just said hey this is I got something you want it they didn't know what it was they didn't do their research and and they look so real right they do I mean, you know Nick when they, when I first started seeing them I could pick out the impurities I could see the difference but I'm also a doctor and I'm sure and I probably have a PhD in those things but uh, but I can't tell the difference anymore. You know, I see the ones that our undercover agents buy on the street and they turn out to be fentanyl and I can't tell the difference. And that's the scary thing. And that's what I always want families and, and young people to know is is it's not this chronic use anymore. Can you still die from that? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But you can die one time. And, you know, it, it's like it's like my patient I told you about when we first started. You know, there's a chance that 
that he got a hold of something yesterday, mm. right? And 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 maybe you know didn't know what it was, and sure. And so that that's to me the real scary part. And if you look at our overdose numbers, they really shot up when when fentanyl came on the scene. Man, well, um, I mean, it's just it's it's. There, I have honestly, I could sit back here and talk to you about this for hours and hours and hours. It's it's just such a deep thing, and and seeing how it affected all the members of the family and the tolls it took on all of them, not just the people that were going through it. It's just, it's, 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 it's horrible. It, it is, it's horrible. And, um, but it can be beaten. Yeah, it, it can. And, and I talk about, I, I'm a Tennessee and I told you that when we walked in here a little while ago, I'm proud to be a Tennessee. And, and, and so I take Tennessee with me wherever I go. And uh, Alex Haley, uh, the author is, is from Tennessee. His family was enslaved in West Tennessee, but he grew up in Norris, Tennessee and East Tennessee. And he talks about a turtle on a fence post. And I, 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 I leave people with this. This is an image that we can all see. There's one thing you know for sure when you see a turtle on a fence post. What's that? It didn't get there by itself. A turtle did not shimmy up that fence post. I love that. Right. So when you see somebody like me or you see somebody in recovery, I promise you this. They did not get there by themselves. That's right. This is support. Guys, this is community. I still believe in the goodness of people. I don't care how many times I watch the evening news and I see one side lobbing hand grenades at the other. And, and you know, I still believe in goodness. My dad, my dad uh, had back surgery and I was with him this past weekend and he had a couple of his buddies that meet at McDonald's, you know, every Saturday morning to solve the world's problems. And he had, and they called him to check on him. How are you going to be at church Sunday? And I remember listening to that going, you know, this happens across our country every single day. We still care about each other. These men in their 80s care about my dad who had a back surgery and they want to know when he's going to be at McDonald's. That's right. We still care about each other. You did this show today because you care about this issue and you care about the people out there that could be affected and the possibility that it could affect your own family. Right. Right. We still care about each other. This is community. It's relationship. And when you see somebody in recovery, I'm telling you, they're a turtle on a fence post. They're there. I'm here for you today because I had this group of people that surrounded me, loved me, and gave me a path to recovery. And I think that's our challenge here in Tennessee. How do we set up a system where everybody gets that? Let me ask you this, um, just because you never know who's struggling with it. And one of the hardest things when you love somebody, even when they're struggling, is to not is to um a lot of times you just want to make them feel better or especially if it's a daddy and a daughter you end up becoming an enabler right you know um you that you know because most times those people go broke they end up moving back home at home or something like that and you know so what what advice would you have for the folks that have somebody going through that to not enable them to further um, the situation they're in, but like that, rec- that, that hope. And I, I would, first thing I would say is feed the, feed your faith. You got like, you know what I'm saying? You got to feed your faith and you got to feed it hard, as hard as you've ever fed anything, their faith too. Um, you got to teach them about hope because like, you know, that if you look up like the, de- the definition of, of like what, how they describe it in the Bible, like, um, hope is not something that you can see, right? That's not hope. Right. So, um, and it's, and it's, you overcame it and you've seen like there's unbelievable amounts of people that are going through it on the on the bad side there's also people that are recovering from it but i'm not hearing those i I need those people here you do so so middle tennessee and nashville in particular is one of the best recovery cities in the united states it's well known oh wow and uh, i love that that communities out there if they hear this i love all of them uh but we we have had some you know some prominent folks uh talk about this our our former mayor megan barry Mm -hmm. you know lost her son max and megan has been very public about that and what she's been through and what her family's been that's wonderful it is and and so you know this is this is one of the things I, I really love, you know, looking at and, and I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a Bible thumper, Nick. I'm just not, you know, I've got faith and golly, sometimes it's horrible faith, right? I, it's not anywhere where I want it to be. But but the Apostle Paul uh, described addiction better than anybody ever heard. He says, why is it I do the things I don't want to do yet? I don't do the things I want to do. Guys, that's addiction. Mm. I can't I can't do it better than the Apostle Paul. Mm. And and so we we have to understand that. And the, the enabling thing, I've seen that carried so far. I had a had a psychiatrist one time asked me when Narcan came on the scene, he goes, well, how many times do you Narcan somebody? You know, don't they need to hurt a little bit? Well, does that hurt include letting them die? 
Mm. You know, how many times would I go in a, a, a flop house to get my son? I mean, Nick, the truth is I'd go in as many times as I needed to. That's right. What it takes is what it takes. It is. It is. And and so I struggle with finding out where that thing is enabling now, giving somebody money to go. But, you know, that that that's a little different. Um, but I, I really struggle with that. And it's very hard. I'll tell you what I don't do. I don't judge families that have done it. Okay. They love their kid. My wife told me, she says, Steve, there are bigger sins than loving your kid too much. And uh, there are. Mm. And so I see these families that, that you know, it's classic enabling. I don't beat them up over that. They love their kid. They're trying their best to do what they can do to help their kid. What would you do to help yours? Sure. I'd do anything. No doubt. No doubt. i do anything. You name it. I'll commit a crime. I'll do whatever I need to do. Absolutely. So so I don't beat families up. But what I want them to see is is the thing that we can do. First of all, we got to help ourselves. I get families say, Steve, what do I need to do? And I said, well, let's start to work on you. What do you mean start to work on me? They're the problem. I'm not the problem. I said, I'm going to have that painted across the back of my wall. Right. We all are damaged by it. And I am, I am of no help to someone until I get help myself. Right. And so I start with that and the things I can control are me and my, re, my actions and reactions. So start there and then just keep consistently showing up. Hey, you don't have to keep living like this. Here's some things that I can help you with when you're ready. And I keep it in front of them. And, and I don't give up. Hmm. You know, I get patients that, co- you know, come back to see me after they've been gone a while and say, Dr. Lloyd, you're going to be mad. You know, I'm like. I'm so glad to see you. Yeah. Right. You're not dead. You're not in the newspaper. I am so glad to see you. And, and at first they think it's, you know, it's fake. Well, it's not fake. I'm glad to see him. And, and so again, I go, the, the old prodigal son story, right? This stuff is real. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the way I do it. I don't know where that enabling line is. Nick, I've never been able to figure it out. You described it perfectly, right? I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah. So, so what I do is, is I do my best to show people pathways and here's what's available. I get how do how do they see or measure like I I guess is what they're doing working are they enabling them is it working like I guess is there any signs of improvement you know yeah. even the smallest yeah. the smallest bit how do you celebrate those victories and not call them participation trophies when you're working with those right. folks I I try to find I find try to find little areas of insight right mm-hmm. so whenever you whenever you're using the frontal lobe of your brain basically shuts down like you had a lobotomy and so your frontal lobe is responsible for insight judgment and empathy. And so in addiction, you're driven solely by a reward system that's unchecked by that. Mm. Right. So just think about this, you know, us here in this room, what would we do if we did not have a frontal lobe? I mean, the three of us would be in jail before lunch. Right. <laughs> if we were right, if we were if we were driven solely by a reward system, because that's our nature. But we have fully developed frontal lobes. that gives us insight, judgment and empathy. Right. OK. So in, in, in addiction, full addiction, you don't have that. Wow. Right? And so okay. you're just controlled by your, your reward center. So I try to get families to understand that and start looking for little pieces of insight because it takes for two years for that to come back online it takes 90 days to even start coming back online wow so I want family- okay so yeah. when they go to rehab that's why it's such a long lengthy thing because if they go less than 90 days they didn't change much they, they didn't have time to and that's why i continually rail on some of these programs they're not long enough mm. right you've got to be in there that amount of time to even start to have when you start looking at 12-step groups 12-step steps come to 90 meetings in 90 days what, what's magic about that Nothing that happens in the meeting, everything when it comes to time and recovery, the frontal lobe. So that's what we have to get people to understand. Mm, man. Well, this is um, I, I knew this was going to be really, really good. And uh, and uh, lo and behold, here we sit. We deliver. Right. Um, let me ask you. Let me switch subjects just a little bit. Um, so you have an amazing family, right? Two adult, two adult children. You're a granddad now. Well, going to be in September. Going to yes. be in September. Yeah, yes. that's congratulations. Thank you. I'm jacked. <laughs> and um, and and your wife Karen. So I want. I just you know, we're talking about how it affects the families and all those things. Let's let's dig a little bit deeper there because like your family's still intact. You know, uh, you guys made it through the gauntlet. You right. got on the other side. Right. Um, and then your wife had to relive it, watching the series. It is, and and that's where. You know, my own self-centeredness got involved um, because when Dope Sick came out and it was a it was a success pretty much from the start. And, you know, it, was, it won two Emmys. Right. It's big. Yeah. Uh, you know, best book was great. And I can't remember how many copies it sold, you know, 500,000 or so, which is a lot. Uh, it was a New York Times bestseller. There's been 20 million people seen Dope Sick, you know. And mm. so, it, it, you know, from that point, just to, the, getting it out there was so huge. But, you know, when we were watching it, I watched it just like everybody else. I didn't know what stories they used, what they didn't. But I've been through those a lot, Nick. I do. I mean, you and I have talked about the work I do. I mean, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. I forgot about her. Mm. You know, I forgot about her 
sitting there next to me watching this unfold on TV because she lived it too. And now it's right in her face. And I didn't, I, I didn't pay enough attention to that. I didn't pay that the respect that it deserves because if I'm a turtle on a fence post, the one that picked me up off the ground and stuck me up there was her. Right. Right. She suited up and showed up. Um, the AA Big Book, I've got a little one, and it's one of my most prized possessions. I got it as soon as I got into treatment. I still have it. And Karen wrote inside uh, the front cover, said, accept the grace. Mm. Mm. Right. I love that. Accept yeah. the grace. Yep. And well, go ahead. You know, j- just watching it, you know, and I looked over at her, and I, you know, I saw her squirming a little bit and drop her head a few times, and that's when I realized that, man, Steve, it's been a while, but but there's still wounds there. And, and this wound is one we need to talk about. And we have. And, you know, my kids watched it. And, and for them, my daughter was so young, she doesn't remember it. Now, Heath, you know, when you met, he, he does remember it. And I watch the work he does now because he works in this field. And it's so interesting to see what he brings to the table as a young man who's playing, you know, Little League baseball with his buddies with a dad who has drug addiction. Right. Yeah. And how he talks about that. And, and he confronted me. <laughs> he actually confronted me. I was going to ask. Yeah, he, he did. You know, as an adult, he confronted me and because he was nine years old when i left and and heath and i i mean i come in from work and by gosh we're on the baseball field batting cage t i mean every day we didn't miss and you know that right that's right right. and uh and so he said i came home one day and you weren't there and nobody told me anything and you were just gone and i'm mad yeah and and the thing that that chip dodd did for me was we when my kids came to see me six weeks deep i sat in a room with them i told them what was wrong with me you know, I told them that daddy got sick on medicines that doctors use, which is what they could understand at that time. And then as time has grown, grown on, you know, they've obviously know everything. But back then they didn't. And Heath actually confronted me about it. It was an interesting time. And and he actually confronts me quite a bit. When did so, it happen the first time? Oh, gosh. Uh, he was a uh, he was a junior in high school. He went to Science Hill in East Tennessee. And mm. uh I can't remember. And, and he's hit me with some things, you know, growing up, and, you know, in, in my relationship with him, um, he was a baseball player. I love baseball and, and I treated him worse than any of my players. And well, that would have happened regardless. Right. Of you. Right. Because right, right. I'm the same way. Yeah, no doubt. No, no. <laughs> but there were some recovery things that happened in there because Heath actually confronted me about it. And I remember, I remember one day he told me, he said, dad, I wish you treated me half as well as you treat your students. Mm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I stopped and thought, and, and so Nick, our relationship changed with Heath, you know, being healthy enough to confront me about things that were hurting. And what he was telling me was, Dad, I'm hurting, and you're the one hurting me, and I'd like you to stop. Mm-hmm. How many kids have that inside of them to tell their dad? Oh, that's awful. Right. It's a lot of courage. Right. Ton of courage. And I knew where he got that courage. And so Heath and I's relationship changed when I went from being his biggest critic to his biggest fan. Mm. And it's that way today. He will still confront me today. And I'm not going to tell you, Nick, I always like it. I don't. Right. Um, but it also lets me know that Heath is healthy, and I love that. That is a gift of recovery because that would not have happened otherwise. Right. And and so Haley is Haley's a little bit different, but Haley has confronted me as well. Some of the things that we did, and this is this is a this is one that'll get you. So as part of my recovery process, we're doing some work with with somebody helping us, and the, the exercise was uh, Haley took a list, and and the title was this: "Daddy, it hurt me when," and then she filled in. The blanks. Oh man! And I sat across from her in the chair, and I listened to those. <laughs> wow, that's a really good exercise, yes, sir. It, it's a really good exercise when you have somebody that's trained in helping you deal with it, because it would you could think, well, golly, that would be terribly shaming for me to sit there and listen to. But but Nick, it was the turning point in mine and Haley's relationship. Okay, because some of those things I didn't know or I didn't realize the effect they had on her, and now. I had a chance to step into relationship with her. Oh, wow. Good yeah, stuff, man. That's right. None of that happens without addiction. None of it. Mm. We go through, how you doing? Fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know oh, all yeah. the cliches, right? How you doing? Well, daddy, I'm actually hurting. Uh, you told me you were going to do this, but, but you didn't because something else came up was more important. Yeah. And I'm hurt. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And uh, so I look at those little things in my life, and none of those things would have happened without addiction and recovery. Mm. Mm. And and I don't know if I, I, you may have said this before, but I'm not sure how long how long um, did your uh, addiction and recovery like how long was that? How long of a like was it years? 
I went I went start to finish with pill addiction in just a little over four years. And I, I tell people I'm I'm so grateful for pills because it had taken alcohol 40 years to do it. <laughs> yeah, and and I, but, but don't misinterpret that. Absolutely. Okay? But it's, I, it's, you got it's, my point, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Right. So uh, so for a little over four years of just hardcore active addiction, going places I never thought I would go. And uh, if I make it, you know, another month and a half, uh, it'll be 19 years in recovery. Man, congratulations. Yes, sir. That's fantastic. And how long, how long, because the biggest part of the recovery works usually if you finish it, not if you quit it, right? <laughs> That's very, but we talk about the difference between quitting and finishing all the time and how they look and smell very much the same. Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny, the, you know, um, the, the family member that went through the rehabilitation process, the time it worked was the time that they finished. That's right. It, it is. And that, I'm so glad you said that because I'm going to steal a bunch of stuff we talked about today, oh, but, my, but, but that's so good. My aunt yeah. passed away due to, um, yeah. due to addiction. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Long uh, years ago, my dad's sister, um, it was something that just it becomes a part of them and 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 she didn't know how to get rid of it you know that's the frustrating thing when you see people that can't see it themselves and and really that's kind of what my job is my job is to try to help my patients see it because i see it i see it clearly i see the path i see the other path as well yeah and so my job becomes trying to help get them to see that to see what they can do and and you know you you described it perfectly and and so i i really look at this nick i mean it, this is so cliche but it is so true in the moment i promise you the time that me and you've been together i have been present i am right here i'm looking you in the eye and i know you feel the same way that's right i try to live my life like that i'll worry about tomorrow when i get up in the morning we tell everybody say around here a lot you got to operate in the future so you can live in the present <laughs> You know what I mean? Yes. Um, we say, we say that a lot, and and you know my my aunt wasn't the one that had the opioid addiction. Hers was alcohol for you know thirty plus years or however many, and and literally it just eventually it just killed her. Yeah. And um and and she was the one that was like it was beautiful and the great dancer and like just so talented, yeah. and just and and kind of uh you know just everything was just cut short. Um, but the, uh, the, the, uh, and, but that took decades to culminate versus the, the addiction of opioids happens in a very sh much shorter amount of time. And then now, as you're saying, you know, that a lot of the deaths are happening, not from people that were addicted just because they took the wrong pill at a party or something. That's right. The, the, the pills and, and, you know, of course the stuff that's on the street, the heroin, the fentanyl, this brings you to your knees so quickly. Mm. It brought me to my knees so quickly. So I became grateful for that. Um, you know, I, my kids, they can't, my, Haley doesn't remember that guy at all. He barely remembers that person. Yeah. They've never seen that. And I raised Thank goodness. Them. Oh, of course. Right. And, and so now he's grown and he's, you know, starting his own family and he, he didn't grow up like that. He didn't face the abuse that I faced as a kid. Mm. And, you know, I guess, Nick, I'm proud of that. Right. I think Absolutely. that's okay to be proud of that. And, you know, his little girl, he's going to have a granddaughter. Uh, uh, his little girl is is going to be light years away from where I grew up and, and how I came along. And so I am uh, I got to say that that, that 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 makes me inside. That makes me feel good. And I think that's OK. I agree 100 percent. How, um, you know, I, I look at you see on TV in movies and and i thought about this in 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 my life 10 a little over 10 years ago when i was at a really low point in life and i wasn't the man that uh, my then not even wife yet deserved and my super young son um the, it's like the picture i showed you when i was 50 pounds heavier you know <laughs> um it's um I, I wonder sometimes because you know when i was not the person i should have been her my wife's friends and family didn't care for me too much and and um, you know it was like you know you don't have to stay there type thing come over here and all that stuff and and i used to hate that they did that and almost resented them for me at the end of the day like why wouldn't they do that i was i was a jerk yeah you know what i mean and i wasn't healthy and i wasn't making good decisions as a professional i was a loser yeah. like you know what was what good did i really bring <laughs> it's it's you know i have those moments too and i know exactly what you're talking about but but you know you really have to have you have to be awake to that you're, mm -hmm. you're awake to that right absolutely you look at that and you go man they were right absolutely and, they, were, they were right right, right. And, and so i used to think that the person that loved you put their arm around you and told you what a great guy you are mm. right that was my definition of somebody that loved you the person that loves you put your put your arm around you looks you dead in the eye and and and, and shows you things you can't see for yourself mm. and those are the people i want in my life 
Mm, that is right. That is absolutely right, man. Like, is there any like is there anything else did we did we I want to make sure like you, you your story like this is a great opportunity to hear an amazing story that can help so many other people because it can give them the hope you know we said hope you can't see but they can actually see yeah. the hope that you found when you couldn't see it. Right. It's one of the things I, I, I always want to leave people with is they look at me now, right and and. And, and I still have issues. You know that. I mean, we, we battle stuff. Oh, I'm a walking issue. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. So, you know, I, I tried to teach Heath. You know, one of my early heroes was Ali. Right. I loved Ali. Yeah. And Ali would, you know, he's the, he's, he's the champ, right? The greatest. And he said, you know, it's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up. And, you know, I, I live my life that way. I want people out there to know I still struggle. Now, I don't struggle with the same things I used to struggle with, but but I do have the courage to stand back up. And the thing that, that I always remember is to ask for help. There are people out there that care, and there, there are people out there that will care about you. Mm. And, uh, you know, just, just remember that. Ask for help. I don't care how bad it is, and I don't care if you can't see a light. I don't care. Have the courage to ask for help. Amen. And if, if we do that and, and as a community now, now the responsibility is on us as a community to respond, because sometimes we're like, well, you can ask for help. But here are the conditions that we're going to give you. Right. And and I'm not saying that there aren't times that that comes into play, but but I'm talking about unconditional. Mm. Uh, like you love your kid. Mm. Right. And so so that's what I want people to know, because a lot of times I get people approach me and they want me to hand them the recovery. OK, here. I've got this and, and let me hand it to you. Nick, if I could figure out a way to do that, I would do it. All right. No, and doubt. there's a good chance no I could get really, really rich. Uh, but, but the truth is, is that I don't know how to do that. I, all I can do is share my experience, strength and hope with you and help you find the path that, that's right for you. So, so people out there who are struggling, it is not perfect and you won't be perfect. I'm not perfect. The recovery process ain't perfect neither. No, we're close. Life in general ain't perfect. I saw a great, uh, I saw a great quote the other day by Kara Lawson, right? oh, coach yeah. at Duke, right? It's like, learn how to do hard better. That's right. right? It, learn how to do hard better. And I think in my recovery, I've learned how to do hard better. Uh, things are still hard. Uh, when I leave here in a little bit, I've got a couple of hard things I'm going to have to do, but I do them way better. And if I keep my patient at the focus, I'll be successful. That's right. Well, that's what we say. The same thing about a great business is that if, if, if it's all about the customer experience, man. And if and if you create a great, create a great experience for them, then you did a good job. Yeah. Right. You did a good job. I have, a, I have a mentor that taught me this and, and it's it's my favorite. He said the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. <laughs> so uh, that's that's what we're talking about. That's and, right. Uh, so that's right. Um any for folks that may be hearing this today that's saying, hey, you know, like I know somebody or I'm going through this right now. Where are some places like where should they start looking for resources if anybody wanted to read into this or look into this further? Obviously, he got a great website, mm -hmm. drstevenloyd.com. That's where they can keep up with a lot of stuff there. That's where they can find you and all those stuff. But like, you know, and, and you're on some socials as well. Mm -hmm. But like where's so just some are there any great resources spots? Well, first of all, I'm easy to find. And, and I return all of them. Um, I spend time, you know, if I, if you ever see me walking around Nashville on my phone, uh, you know, it looks like I'm texting. I'm more than likely returning, returning that because I enjoy it I, and, I, and I get excited because I know what's possible. Mm. So you can always reach out to oh, me wow. through multiple modalities. Uh, the state of Tennessee actually does a really good job here. Um, so there, there are multiple resources available, even if you have no money. Uh, there are resources available in our state and, 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 and more are on the way. So I'd encourage you, uh, to, you know, to, to use those resources. There's multiple resources around Middle Tennessee and really all across the state, uh, from the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Um, you know, you can always reach out to your church or your, or your faith institute. Uh, that's, a, that's always a good place uh, to get started. Doesn't matter if you hadn't darkened the doors in 30 years. Don't matter. Right. It's a good place to get started. So those are some, some places I would tell you initially. And then I, I can't live in middle Tennessee and not, and not at least talk about the, the, the 12 step community in middle Tennessee. It is strong. It is vibrant. And, and, and there are a lot of people in it that, that are some of the best people I've ever met in my life that are willing to reach out and help you. Mm. Man. Um, and, and I, I, so as far as the, as the, the churches go, um, I have a lot of great relationships with some really fine pastors mm -hmm. and, um, they're mentors, all of them are mentors to me. Right. Yeah. And, but like then, and churches are always looking for places and ways they can help. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I don't know if I've been to a church, visited a church, or seen a church lately that's promoting that. The, how how can they get involved? How could they get involved? <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll be biased here. So the the church I go to in Nashville is Cross Point, and we have a pastor named Kevin Queen. And Kevin has no idea that I even know him. All right, right. he has no idea who I am. Uh, it's it's. It's one of the most healing places I go to in my week. Is that uh, nobody's perfect, everybody's welcome. I mean, that's it. And and Kevin believes that, but there are multiple churches uh, throughout throughout Nashville that do that. And uh, you know, there are recovery congregations around Nashville. Uh, the, the state of Tennessee, actually, which you don't think of of state government mixing like this, but it actually does. See, that's what I love, and, that, and I wish we had more. On yeah. That, you know? So I got to get I got to give you a guy to talk about that. But there's a guy in, in Tennessee named Dr. Monty Burks, and and Monty, uh, I think there's over three hundred. Uh, recovery certified congregations in the state of Tennessee today. Mm. And what Monty does is he trains these churches on addiction and trains them how to utilize the resources of their church to help the people in their community, mm. be it using the church van to take somebody to a doctor's appointment, those type of things. And those are the things that don't make the front page of the Tennessean. Right. right? And they need to. And, and some of them do every now and then, but we have a lot of resources in our state and those recovery congregations are spread from Johnson County to Shelby County. And so uh, it is a good resource in middle tennessee we've got a bunch of churches that you know that believe in this they host 12-step groups and they host to uh, celebrate recovery groups that right. you see banners so we really are, are, are blessed here in middle tennessee to have those resources man well this has been um i, I knew it was going to be uh, a great conversation i didn't I, real quick before i forget we gotta we gotta uh, talk about your podcast 70x7 <laughs> podcast you host it with your son heath yeah right um and the staff of cedar recovery i do um, so tell us a little bit about that well, because we gotta go check we gotta check that out well it's 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 not near what, what we're doing here um in it but it is it is open and honest conversation about topics in recovery uh the first two episodes and we've done one season the first two episodes uh, are are me and heath uh, you know, talking about what what we have been through as a family, and then we take several topics. Um, I think there's seven or eight episodes. We take several topics that I think are important in recovery. We're getting ready to start recording again, and, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to take current events in in, in the recovery world. What we're, you and I are talking about: opiate abatement money, where to get help, uh, stories. Right? People relate to stories, so that's what we're trying to do. Nothing. Uh, you know, sometimes when I watch recovery podcasts, they're they're way up here, yeah. And right, and and that's a good thing. I'm, I'm not knocking that at all but i want to talk about you know ground level stuff that we run into on a daily basis and, sure. and the things that i see like what i'm dealing with right now i mean to, this has been emotional for me because in the back of my mind the whole time we've been in here i lost somebody right. i lost somebody in the last two days that it turns out we couldn't help and and so i, I want yeah. i want to make people aware of that and what that's like and then also different ways to get treatment because we we tend to put things in boxes and we say well if you're doing this you're not really in recovery if you're doing this you're not really in recovery and 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 that that prevents people from stepping out and ask for help. So those are the kind of topics that we want to address. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, they can find it pretty much anywhere that you can find a podcast. You, you, you right? can. So I tell you what, when you're listening with us right here, just get out your phone. There's a little magnifying glass and a little search bar, right? 70 X seven. So it's spelled the word 70 X seven podcast. Yes. Right. So that's it. That's it. And, uh, and it's with uh, Dr. Stephen Lloyd, man, this has been great. Thank you so much for being here. Nick, I don't have the words to, to tell you how grateful I am. It's been great. Well, uh, once again, folks, any um, anything you want to know about Dr. Stephen, keeping up with him, checking in on him, all those things. He's on social, but you can check him out at drstephenloyd.com. Once again, man, this has been a an absolute treat. I can't thank you enough uh, for being here. And um, I'd like to bring you back. And, and tell me the name of the guy that's uh, Monty. Is it Monty? Do- Dr. Monty Burks. Yeah. I, I would love an introduction to him. Yeah, you, you, you will. Uh, he's also an MMA fighter. So there's a lot of stuff there. Oh, man, that's cool. <laughs> well, I, hey, man, I'd love to hear more about what he's doing and, and maybe be share that with everybody too so you bet. that'd be really cool um man this this has been neat this has been neat anything else before before we bring this sucker to a close uh the, the board that you talked about before we walked in here hope there is hope right mm. have the courage to step out even if you can't see it i can't think of a better way to bring it to a close man well folks once again thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the hit streak i am your man nick Hyder. god bless